annual Ahmed Ispahani that is your Vito International Lecture. I'm Katie Gavini. I am the director of the International Studies Institute. And I'm so pleased to see you all today for what's going to be, I think, a really uh, important and invigorating uh, lecture uh, on the refugee problem of the moment. So before we get started on the weighty issues, let me just call up the 18th president uh, of the University of Bern, uh, Dr. Deborah Lieberman, uh, for a few welcoming comments. Thank you. joy it is to be here and uh, very nice, very nice attendance. I know for the students that you weren't required to be here. Exactly. You're here because you want to be here. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Park. You definitely were not required to be here. Thank you. So this is the 11th year of this lectureship. Every year we are inspired, and once again, I thank the committee who brought Dr. Betts here because we're going to have just a, another inspirational lecture. And here at the University of Auburn, inspiration is just a piece of it because the lecture will all be grounded in our values, just like the uh, series and why it was founded. So I just want to remind everybody that when, 11 years ago when this began, and it was our benefactors, Mr. Paul Mosley, one of our alumni, it was founded because Paul Mosley, who had Dr. Ispahani as a faculty member when Paul was here in the... 84 to 88. 84 to 88. I almost said 70s, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Oh, I was talking about myself. Um, when Paul Mosley graduated and he had, had Dr. Ispahani as a professor, he felt in that class and many other classes, he felt the core of this university. He felt the soul of this university. And he felt the values of this university, especially the values that had to do with diversity, inclusivity, community engagement, and doing good for the world that when one graduates from this university, you don't just have skills, and you just don't have experience and academic knowledge, you have a commitment to do things that truly enhance our communities in the world. So when Paul established this lectureship, he did it because Dr. Ispahani lives his life that way, and he brings that to his classes every day. Dr. Ispahani, I always like to take a minute and um, recognize him personally. This wouldn't be here if it weren't for Paul Mosley. Paul did this <coughs> Dr. Ispahani, who has taught at this university for 54 years, brings that to his class every day, brings it up to the university, these values and this commitment of making his community a better place and enhancing the student's experience every single day. Dr. Ispahani.
uh, Dr. Ian Lissing, who's the Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences, a world-class debater, and even more important than that, a world-class mentor for other faculty in every one of your students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lieberman. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my indeed, indeed my honor and privilege to introduce the speaker for today. Now, rather than inundate you with a long list of things that he's accomplished in his life, I think it's better to get to know the person who we get to see today and the reason why he's had so much impact on my life. Uh, I, I met him 20 years ago. Uh, when I was at an old university helping run the World of Age Championships, and he was a freshman student uh, speaking at that same event. And admittedly, we didn't really get to know each other very well because I was busy running the event, and he was busy debating and being very nervous as a freshman to be. Uh, but I would get to know him a year later when I was representing the University of Laverne at the Oxford University Debating Tournament. I have, to, I have to actually to uh, adjudicate or judge a round where he was in. And in those debate rounds, when, they're in, when they end, we have the opportunity to tell the teams how they did. And so I don't remember the result, he didn't remember the result. Uh, but I remember this very, very carefully, very, very well, because in the thousands of students that I've had uh, adjudicated, he was the first one to ever look at me in the eyes and say, how could that round have been better? He didn't say, how could I have done better? He didn't say, how could I have won? He didn't say, he's away, why did I lose? <laughs> he said, how could that round have been better? And what struck me was that he was in it for the long haul. He understood that the debate was far greater than just a competition. There was something that needed to be achieved. And our friendship started there, because what I saw over the next few years, aside from him winning uh, the European Championships in 2006 and the World Masters Championship in 2003, uh, having his own illustrious debating career, I also saw a friend grow into being such a, an amazing advocate for people who had no voice. And this is who Alex was to me. It's who he is to me and who he will always be. And I think that's the mark of what makes him exceptional. So it's not just his ability to speak so many truths that we think very carefully not to, but it's being able to reach people in a way that no one else can. Besides being a world-class academic, he's also a world-class athlete. He's uh, a little over 48 hours removed from running in a cold Boston Rain. You know, for the marathon, not just because he wanted to. <laughs> um, and he himself, uh, in, in, for six, he's run, run six marathons of the, the World Abbott uh, Marathons, international uh, time. The time that he had actually is, I think, top ten of all time if you get it collectively for, for running it, all six of them. So you can always correct me if I was wrong with that. But, uh, but it's, it's just, he's just an exceptional guy. And so I really don't want to take any more time from him to be able to share with you what he has to share. So ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexander Best. Thank you very much to all of you, President Lieberman, Professor Lissing, colleagues for, for being here and giving me such a warm welcome. I've wanted to come to the University of Laverne for a very long time, um, ever since my dear friend Ian brought a debate team in his first year at Laverne to my college uh, at Durham University where I was an undergraduate. I've been inspired by the meeting I had with his students that he mentored as debaters, by seeing Laverne students represent the institutions around the, institution around the world. And I've wanted to come here and see from my own eyes this very special place you obviously have. So to be able to come here and give this lecture is a true honor for me. And if I may return the very dear compliments of, of my great friend, I, I wouldn't be standing here today 
but for him, both in the most obvious literal sense of extending the invitation, <laughs> but also in the, the more profound sense of that debate tournament that I went to, the first big competition I'd ever been to as an 18-year-old, hosted in Manila in the Philippines, was the first opportunity I ever had to leave my country and go somewhere other than Europe and North America. It was my first trip to the developing world, and it was my first big debate competition. And I returned from there with my eyes opened. I wanted to know about and understand global issues. I wanted to understand questions of world politics. And it was no coincidence that it was a few months after that that I had the chance to go and do voluntary work with refugees in Europe, in the Netherlands. And I would have passed up that opportunity, but for the experiences I'd had in Manila and through being introduced to debating. And Ian was a big part of that. So there's a very real sense in which being here for me is not just another lecture, but an event that I've always wanted to be part of, to be able to thank Ian very publicly for his mentorship, but also to see this great institution and meet the wonderful students here on campus. What I'm going to talk to you about is an issue that has become increasingly important. When you're an academic, you can work on something for many, many years, and nobody really cares. You can do it quietly, under the radar, and then suddenly, something can change in the world, and it becomes one of the biggest issues. And that's what's happened to me over the last couple of years. And the issue of refugees has become one of the defining issues of the 21st century. People are moving across borders in significant numbers, not because they're choosing to, but because they're forced to. Because the circumstances in the countries they come from, whether they're authoritarian dictatorships, whether they're fragile countries and states, or conflict-ridden societies, are meaning that they have to leave the countries they've come from to access their basic rights. So who is a refugee? And why do we have a system to protect refugees as distinct from other groups of immigrants? Well, the reason lies in the legacy of the Second World War. It lies in the aftermath of the Holocaust and the start of the Cold War. Millions were displaced in Europe after the Second World War, and many millions more started to move east to west, voting with their feet and leaving the emerging communist regimes of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. And in response, the world created something very important. It agreed on an international institutional framework to protect and seek solutions for the plight of refugees. They created an international organization, the United Nations Refugee Agency, and an international treaty, the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees. And that treaty is a simple document. It defines who is a refugee as a person who's outside her country of nationality, owing to a well-founded fear of persecution for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a social group, or political opinion. And that document says that people in that situation have certain rights, that they can't be forcibly sent home to where they may face persecution, and they have to be given a basic set of civil, political, social, and economic rights while they're in exile. But that system, that reciprocal agreement where civilized nation states agreed to uphold that basic commitment is today under threat. I make it a policy of mine not to go to other people's countries and criticize the politics of their governments. <laughs> but I'll make an exception today. <laughs> the issue of refuge has come to the forefront of US attention. And that's particularly in the context of two executive orders brought to bear by the president first in January 2017 and then March 2017, threatening to undermine the fantastic history and contribution of this country to global resettlement. Resettlement takes place when refugees are brought in an organized system from refugee camps or cities around the world, often the most vulnerable, to another country, a country like the United States or another country in the world, in order to start a new life and receive integration. And this wonderful country has been the leader in resettlement around the world. It's resettled three million refugees since 1970. 
And many of those, for instance, the Vietnamese of the 70s and 80s, have gone on to start businesses and make a huge contribution to society. The numbers resettled have been consistently high. In 2017, the US resettled nearly 60,000 refugees. But the executive orders briefly suspended that in early 2017. And with a number of challenges in the courts, a new executive order was launched in which people from certain countries were not allowed to travel to the United States. And some of those countries, like Somalia, Libya, Iraq, um, Syria, are some of the most conflict-ridden, weak states, least able to provide for the basic needs of their populations. But to be even-handed in my criticism, the context in which refuge is being even more undermined is on my own continent in Europe. And this image illustrates one of the campaign posters <laughs> of the Leave campaign in Brexit, the campaign for my country to leave the European Union. And it was launched by the leader of the United Kingdom Independence Party, Nigel Farage, with the slogan, Breaking Point, arguing that the European Union had failed in the context of over a million asylum seekers coming to Europe in 2015. The largest number of those people were desperate and vulnerable Syrians coming across the Aegean Sea from Turkey to seek asylum and sanctuary. But with that group, there were other people coming from Iraq and Afghanistan, people coming across the central Mediterranean from Libya to Italy, originally from West Africa, the Horn of Africa and East Africa. And in Europe, there has been a backlash against asylum and refugees. Part of the legacy of that has been Brexit in my country, the rise of populist nationalism in Germany and elsewhere across the continent. And we are at a crossroads in thinking about refuge and its place in our civilized countries. But it's very important that we stand back and get a perspective. What is the scale of the refugee challenge? How big are the numbers? Can we manage it? And if so, how should we manage it? How can we get beyond the model response that I saw in Europe, where over the last three years, 10,000 people have died, mainly through drowning, trying to reach the European Union, a continent where basic human rights standards are unraveling. Well, one of the headline figures we see is that today more people are displaced around the world than at any time since the Second World War, some 65 million people. And about a third of those displaced people are refugees who have crossed the border. The other two thirds are what are called internally displaced persons. They haven't crossed the border, but they're in a refugee-like situation in their own country. But I think we need to see that headline figure in perspective. 22 million refugees is just 0.3% of the world's population. 0.3%. Surely, collectively, as a group of some 195 countries, we could cooperate to provide sanctuary and safe haven to that number of people. It should be manageable. We also need to get perspective on the geographical distribution of refugees, because they're not equitably distributed around the world. And most refugees are not in North America. They're not in Europe. They're not in rich countries around the world. But most are geographically concentrated in low and middle income countries around the world. Let's take the example of Syrian refugees. There are around 5 million Syrian refugees. And this image, which I rather like as one of the few good infographics in the area, is a little out of date because it comes from 2015. But I like it because it graphically illustrates where most Syrian refugees are. It shows that the majority of displaced, some 7.6 million at that stage, had not even left Syria. They were displaced internally. And then the next groups were in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Today, the figure in Turkey is 2.6 million refugees, and it hosts more refugees than any other country around the world. But the numbers shrink relatively when you get to Europe. Germany received about half a million Syrian refugees in 2015, and the numbers went up a bit in 2016. But Europe has 28 member states, and with shared responsibility, and cooperation, this could have been a manageable challenge. But it's those frontline states that I think we need to focus on if we're going to understand the real nature of the refugee issue and where people 
are really struggling, struggling. And to do that, I want to ask the question, what does the current refugee system look like? But I want to ask what it looks like from the perspective of a refugee. If you are a refugee, how does it serve you? What does it do to your needs? How do you experience those international institutional frameworks as somebody fleeing across a border? Let's imagine that you are a Syrian family and you've been in Homs and your city has been decimated and destroyed. It's impossible for you to remain at home and to stay. You have the choice, obviously, that you can become an internally displaced person. You can try and have your needs met by humanitarian aid in country, but for the most part, that's an insecure and dangerous existence. So most people cross a border. But if you cross a border, you're left with three basic choices that I would suggest are all impossible choices. Option one, you can go to a refugee camp. This is the Zatari refugee camp, home to 83,000 Syrian refugees. And it's on the border of Jordan, where it joins to Syria. And the advantages you have if you go to a camp like this is you get basic assistance. You get shelter, you get food, you get clothing. The huge disadvantages are you don't have access to work or access to jobs. You give up the right to move freely. And around the world, people get stuck in camps for five years, 10 years, 15 years, often without basic economic freedoms, the right to work, move freely, to have their children adequately educated. And so this is an option that most Syrians have bypassed. Less than 10% of Syrian refugees have gone to a refugee camp. The second choice, and this is what the majority of Syrians have been faced with, is to go to an urban area like Amman or Beirut. The problem though with going to an urban area is for the most part you give up access to that predictable assistance. Where international humanitarian aid is provided to refugees in cities, it's usually to the poorest of the poor if it's available. It's very hard for the international community to fund and support urban refugees and the international community, despite new policies, struggles in that regard. So in areas that I've visited, like East Amman, many Syrian families are struggling to make ends meet. They're often keeping their children outside of school and requiring them to go out and work in the informal economy. And this leads to the third choice that many refugees resort to, embarking on perilous, dangerous journeys. And that's exactly what we saw in Europe in 2015. People drowning, attempting to reach Europe. And this is the map of the Mediterranean. And each one of the red dots illustrates somebody who's drowned, and each of the black dots illustrates somebody who's missing. Each one is a person who lost their life fleeing some may have been fleeing for economic reasons. We know that most are likely to have been refugees, but their only way of accessing sanctuary was to risk their lives resorting to human smugglers as the means to cross those territorial waters. I want to argue that there's a better option than those three impossible choices. And rather than just tell the negative story, I want to offer you a positive vision for the future about how we can do this differently and empower people with real better choices. This was me 20 years ago uh, when I had more hair and was considerably younger. And it was that summer after I'd been to my first debate tournament. And I was in the Netherlands, not doing anything particularly spectacular, but helping to build a playground and organizing games and activities for the kids. And while I was there, I was lucky enough to meet refugees from Iraq, Iran, China, Pakistan, Kosovo, Bosnia, Liberia. I expected to feel a huge sense of pity that people had suffered. They'd been in war. They'd had to flee with their families. They were struggling. And yet what I found was a deep sense of inspiration. I met people with skills, talents, and aspirations. They weren't able to work, though, in the Netherlands until they'd had their refugee status determined. And for some, that took three, four, five years stuck in limbo. And I saw that as a huge tragedy. Uh, a Bosniak international lawyer taught me the basis of public international law. An Iranian Olympian taught me table tennis. These were people with the capacity to contribute. There were doctors, lawyers. There were people with kids who could speak five languages because they'd had to integrate to a multicultural community. 
And the tragedy, though, was that they were denied the chance to contribute, denied the chance to be a benefit to their host societies. And the more I traveled in my graduate studies, the more I realized that that situation replicated around the world. This is the Ali Ade refugee camp, a small and miserable refugee camp in Djibouti, near the border with Somalia. And it's home to about 10,000 refugees, a relatively small number, mainly from Somalia and Ethiopia. And many live in these tent-like structures called igloos, and the temperatures get up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Refugees can't work in the camp, and they're left idle. In this slide, on this side, you'll see over here a chap named Wooly. And Wooly arrived in Ali Ade in 1988 from Somaliland. He was 18 at the time, and as far as I know, he's still there in the camp. And what Wooly said to me was, man doesn't live on food and water alone, but on hope. My hope is gone, but I pass it to the next generation. And so in a tent with a blackboard and with chalk, he teaches English language and secondary level maths to students who can't have access to secondary education. And to me, that shows two things. It shows the incredible tragedy of talented people with a contribution to make trapped in limbo indefinitely. But it shows something else. It shows the capacity for innovation, adaptation, a desire to support the community held by so many refugees. So in trying to approach this from an academic perspective, three or four years ago, what I did was start a new project, which is now called the Refugee Economies Project at Oxford. And we're trying to look at the conditions under which refugees are able to be economically included and make a contribution to their host societies. To change the paradigm from one of seeing refugees as a burden to seeing them as a potential benefit. From seeing them just as passive, vulnerable victims to people with agency and capacity to make contributions. And to do that, we started in a particular part of the world, Uganda. Why did we go to Uganda? Not because it's representative of refugee hosting countries around the world, it's not but because it's exceptional. What Uganda has done differently, despite hosting 1.4 million refugees, more than the entire number that reached Europe in 2015, it allows refugees the right to work and freedom of movement. They're able to seek jobs. They're able to set up businesses. And so we went there to find out what difference that made. And we hired and employed refugees as our research assistants, giving them training and research methods. We use quantitative methods based on surveys and qualitative in-depth interviews with refugees and more recently with the host communities. And we looked at long-standing camps, new emergency camps, and the city. And our work challenged a series of myths about how we should see refugees. The first myth we were able to challenge was the idea that refugees are economically isolated. On the contrary, we found that even in the camps, they're importing and exporting goods and services and selling them as part of the global economy. The fabric you see in the slide is a Congolese ceremonial fabric called Bitenge that's sold in the Nakivali settlement in Uganda. When we asked international organization workers where it came from, they said it probably comes across the border from the Congo. But when we asked refugees, they told us a very different story. They said, we import it from warehouses in India in China. What do you think we're doing? Of course we're part of the global economy. What would you do? And so we need to recognize that as a source of opportunity in a globalized world. The second myth our data challenged was the idea that refugees are an inevitable burden. They don't have to be. In Uganda's capital city, Kampala, we found that 21% of refugees run a business that employs at least one other person. And of the people they're employing, 40% are citizens of Uganda. In other words, given the chance, refugees in Uganda are making jobs for the citizens, for the nationals. They're creating businesses that make an economic contribution. We were able to challenge the idea that refugees are economically homogenous. We often imagine refugees in camps as almost living in a Soviet-type Kolkots, as receiving aid, maybe getting a plot of land, and all having an identical economic profile. But there's huge diversity. Yes, the monthly average income we found in Uganda was around 29 US dollars in the settlements. 
but there was huge variation around a bell curve. And we found over 200 distinctive livelihoods activities, including some that use technology. Demu K is a Congolese refugee who arrived with nothing in the settlement and now runs a community radio station and makes documentaries, sometimes for commission, from academics or international organizations. We were also able to challenge the myth that refugees are technologically illiterate. They're not. Even across Uganda, in Kampala, where available, they're using SMS technology, not just to stay in touch with friends and relatives, but as part of their core economic strategies to get information about business, to transfer in PESA, uh, to make calls to clients and customers. And many innovatively adapt low levels of technology. This bicycle, for instance, has been adapted to a tool sharpening business by this Congolese refugee. Um, you have to be a bit careful, as I found, that the spikes don't fly up in your face when you pedal it the wrong way, but most refugees are not nearly silly enough to do that, unlike me. <laughs> the fifth myth we challenged was the idea that refugees are inevitably dependent. Even when they receive aid, you can't live on World Food Programme rations, and so most refugees don't live on the rations they receive. They get on with helping themselves and their families. We found that less than 1% of the households that we surveyed in Uganda had no form of independent income generating activity. Given the chance, they were getting on with helping themselves, their families, and their communities. From the data, we've been able to do really interesting things. We've been able to use regression to look at the correlations between particular variables. And one of the things that had been unanswered that we wanted to find out was what explains variation in income levels for refugees? What explains variation in expenditure levels amongst refugees? Why do some thrive while others merely survive? And we found a series of variables matter. The regulatory environment matters. The more refugees are integrated into the normal mainstream, the better they do. As you move from emergency camps where everything is given to them and provided, to the rural, long-term protracted camps, to urban areas, the more likely they are to have better income and expenditure levels. Education matters. And we found the returns to education go up with each stage. In other words, the income additionally that you get from one extra year of education goes up dramatically from primary to secondary to tertiary. And yet, we know around the world that less than 1% of refugees access tertiary education. There's a huge barrier to high quality educational access. In terms of occupation, as you move from being employed in farming activity to being self-employed in non-farming activities, your income levels go up. Years in exile matters. The more we leave people to linger in exile, the more we reach a tipping point at which their skills are eroded and their income starts to decline. So we have to act before we leave people indefinitely in limbo. And gender matters. Women are still doing far worse than men, and particularly married men. We've turned more recently to Kenya, which is the opposite context to Uganda. It's a country that doesn't give refugees the right to work or freedom of movement. And we wanted to see what happens there, a context where refugees have to stay in camps and can't participate in the economy in the same way. But there were a few surprises. Refugees, despite the legal framework, are getting on with their lives. And in this study, what we were able to do was compare refugees with the host communities to collect data from both. And I think this photo illustrates that it's not always obvious who is the refugee and who is the member of the host community. Who do you think the refugee is in this picture? The refugee is the woman on the right, and the host community member is the woman on the left buying products um, and sorghum from the lady on the right. We collected data in Kenya in the last couple of years from the city and from the Kakuma refugee camp. Our samples are large and representative, and we use participatory methods, employing refugees, recruiting them, and training them. And what we found is that there are surprising and stark examples that show that refugees do work despite the constraints. They get on with their lives. This graph shows, on the left-hand side, Kakuma, the camp environment that we looked at, and on the right, Nairobi, the urban city-based environment. And it shows you the levels of economic activity, the levels of employment from those from Congo, DRC, those from Somalia, SOM, those from SSD, South Sudanese, and the Takana, who are the indigenous um, Kenyans in that area, 
And on the right, you see Somalis, Kenyans, Congolese, and Kenyans split by men and women. And amongst the Congolese in the camp, you have a 73% employment rate. So most of those jobs are with NGOs or small businesses, but they have economic activities despite the constraints. And in the camp context, refugees' employment levels are comparable to those of the surrounding host community. And the gap in the city is that refugees are less likely to be employed than hosts, but it's not as significant as one might imagine. Equally in terms of income, what's fascinating is in the camp environment, refugees are doing better than the surrounding Takana. And when we spoke to the Takana, they said, we welcome refugees. All of our economic opportunities come from the presence of refugees and the international community. Without that, we would have no economy. Yes, they had some security fears, but they recognized the important contribution in employment for their businesses and wanted to host them. Nairobi, the city, it reverses. Refugees do worse than members of the host community, partly because of the legal environment. They're often stopped by police and asked for bribes. Taxes are imposed on them that are sometimes fictitious, and there are huge barriers to success. But despite that, refugees are getting on with it. In terms of living standards, we see the same pattern. In the camp context in Kenya, often refugees actually do better than the surrounding host population. But in the urban context, although refugees do better in the urban areas than in camps, they do worse than the nationals of the host country. So we mapped that out into a basic conceptual framework. And we found that there are four things that make refugees' lives economically distinctive. Regulation, networks, capital, and identity. Put succinctly, how you're governed, who you know, what you have, and who you are. All of those make a difference to how you do economically as a refugee because of being a refugee. But what's important to bear in mind is some of those are constraints and others are opportunities. The regulatory differences that restrict the right to work impose an additional transaction cost, if you like, on refugees. But opportunities like networks, having transnational networks and informal communities, create opportunities for remittances. For instance, in Somalia, sorry, in, in Nairobi, 43% of Somalis receive remittances. And of those that receive remittances, the average level of receiving is equivalent to two and a half thousand US dollars a year. So proportionate to average GDP per capita levels, that's an enormous contribution which gives Somalis access to capital to start businesses. For instance, to quote one Somali um, businesswoman in Nairobi, we started our shop in 2003. Initially, the items were from various places, but now most of the goods are from China. They, Chinese traders, came to Nairobi with some sample clothing. We were introduced by other Somali business people and made trading contacts. Now we order items via email and WhatsApp. My business partner goes to China twice a year. That business was set up with remittances received from relatives and is engaged in the global transnational economy. In other areas, refugees are more constrained, like access to capital. The number with bank accounts is extremely small. It's less than 10% of refugees who are able in Kenya to open a bank account. And very few believe that they could borrow 10,000 Kenyan shillings. Um, in order to start a business. So they set up informal sharing schemes for savings and capital. There are things that are called rotating savings and credit schemes set up by many uh, of the refugees in Nairobi. One member of the Somali community said, we now have 17 members. Every Friday, each member gives 1,500 Kenyan shillings. One person will get this total. In Eastleigh, which is the Somali area of Nairobi, we need to start business to secure our bread, medicine, and police bribes on our own. But it's not easy to get a loan for us. We don't have documents and ID cards, which formal banks request. This is the only way to get initial capital. So they pool a certain amount of savings. Then if one of them needs to start a business or hits hard times, they can withdraw the capital from the collective pot. What stands out for me from these examples is that we need a paradigm shift. We need to go from an aid model based on humanitarian relief that focuses on vulnerabilities to a development model that focuses on building capacities. 
that enables people to flourish as human beings in the neighboring countries where the majority of the world's refugees are. And key to that, emerging from our data analysis, are five things that create enabling environments for refugees. And this isn't rocket science. These are the things that intuitively lead people to flourish socioeconomically. The right to work, access to infrastructure like good roads and uh, good water and good electricity, access to capital, being able to use banks, access to microcredit, connectivity, broadband being so crucial to the lives of refugees and their opportunities, and education. How do we create those things? Now, the problem is around the world that politically there are obstacles to promoting things like the right to work and economic inclusion for host countries. Many governments feel that they host too many refugees. Coming back to Jordan, Jordan is a country that claims to host 1.3 million refugees. And it's suggested, and I think this is roughly equivalent, that that's equal to the United States taking around 60 million refugees relative to population. And so understandably, it has fears about security. It has ISIS on its doorstep. It has fears about undermining economic opportunities for the hosts. And so until relatively recently, it denied refugees from Syria the right to work. Those that moved to urban areas like Amman had to work in the informal economy. When I traveled to the Zatari refugee camp in April 2015 with my colleague Paul Collier, after we visited the camp, a minder showed us something else that he thought would give us a break. And it was an economic zone called the King Hussein Bin Talal Development Area. And it was just a 15 minute drive from Zatari. And the government had spent $100 million connecting it to the electricity grid and the road network. But it lacked two things, foreign direct investment and employees. And so we said, hang on a minute. We've just spoken to a lot of refugees that can't work and want to work. You have an economic zone you've invested in that needs workers. Why don't you employ the refugees in the economic zones? And it seemed obvious to us, being Oxford academics, we put two and two together and probably came up with five. Um, but we pitched this idea to the government in Jordan. We pitched it to NGOs and the international community. And to their credit, the royal family in Jordan, that's, that's quite understated politically but has influence when it wants to, brought the political community in Jordan on board. And it led, in February 2016, to the creation of something called the Jordan Compact. A deal laid out in Jordan, sorry, in London at a summit, whereby Jordan committed to give work permits at an affordable level to Syrian refugees in exchange for the European Union providing trade concessions to products produced in certain product categories in the economic zones in Jordan. The World Bank provided concessionary finance, the first time it had provided concessionary finance to a middle income country hosting large numbers of refugees. And the result today is that Jordan committed to provide 200,000 work permits to Syrians and over 70,000 work permits have now been offered. It's not perfect, but when I visited the Sahab economic zone last year in Jordan, I saw some of the progress. One of the factories I visited was the Al Fire company, which makes plastics. And of its 313 staff, 82 were Syrians working alongside Jordanians. And what was perhaps most amazing was that it was a factory that previously operated in Damascus and was under Syrian management. It was creating jobs for Syrians and the Jordanian hosts. And it was exporting to Spain and Sweden under the Jordan Compact rules with 40% of its sales to Europe. And I think this illustrates the potential in that deal, a deal that was difficult and challenging, but has created the right to work for Syrians in Jordan, the chance to develop skills rather than have their skills go to waste so that when they return to post-conflict Syria, they can participate in rebuilding that society. And the managers of Al Fayah can take that business back to Damascus, take it back to Syria, but also retain their business investment in Jordan. And for Jordan, this is a chance to make the leap to manufacturing. As a middle-income country, that's something it struggled with, and it seized this opportunity. Businesses from IKEA to Walmart have invested in supply chain through this model. Just want to say something briefly about Europe. We've also done a study recently looking at the economic lives of Syrian refugees in Europe and how they've done. 
And one of the great tragedies, and I think we see this in many countries, is that of the Syrians who came to Europe, many are extremely educated, but they're not getting access to work. The paradox that we've seen is that some 38% have a university education, and yet 82% of the population we surveyed in the Netherlands, Austria, and the UK are unemployed. So talented people unable to contribute. When we explored the reasons for them being locked out of the labor market, we found three things. First, language barriers. Despite an entitlement to language education, they weren't getting adequate language education to support their access to the labor market. Secondly, disincentives that they felt inhibited their willingness to move from welfare and social security into the labor market without giving up significant amounts of housing support and welfare support. And third, a lack of skills or skills recognition. Their qualifications from Syria were not being recognized and they weren't getting access to higher education or further education to retrain. All of those are areas that need to be addressed if the half million Syrians in Germany and the million Syrians in Europe are going to be able to integrate, flourish, and ultimately contribute to the host societies or the future of Syria. At the start, I suggested that the system today, created in the aftermath of the Second World War, was a very necessary and important mark of civilized societies and a civilized international community. And I stand by that. But systems have to update to a changing world. The skills that matter for promoting refugee rights around the world are not just legal advocacy and humanitarian aid, although they're important. Today, they're about economics, creating opportunities for work and self-reliance, and politics, creating agreements bilaterally, multilaterally, between governments to work better on behalf of refugees. A system that truly served refugees would do three things. The first is it would fulfill a basic duty of rescue. It ensures that when people cross borders, they get access to their basic needs in safe haven countries, food, clothing, shelter. But too often we stop there and we leave people in limbo. So the second area we must focus on is autonomy, jobs, education, socioeconomic rights, and that's where we're failing around the world. And the third is a route out of limbo. It might be acceptable for people to remain in exile for five, maybe even seven years, but 15, 20, 25 years in a camp is unacceptable. People need to move on with their lives. And this is where resettlement, the institution that the US government has been so much a part of, becomes really important. But we need to reimagine it, to use a variety of visas, family reunification, education visas, to ensure that people in need, but with the ability to contribute, get access to the chance to progress, to move up career ladders, and integrate in the societies uh, that they move to through resettlement. And we also need to make sure in Europe and elsewhere, as a last resort, people can move spontaneously where they have to. So what next? A lot is at stake. I've talked about refugees mainly in the current definition of a refugee. But most now are not moving because of individualized persecution by governments, but because they come from fragile states. Over half of the world's refugees come from just three countries, Syria, Afghanistan, and South Sudan. But we struggle to put those weak and fragile states back together. The UN Security Council fails to come up with adequate responses. And so in the absence of addressing those root causes, we will continue to need to support refugees. And we need to be realistic that the majority of refugees need to be supported in their regions of origin, that most do want to go home. But we have to collectively be a part of supporting that. And with environmental change and climate change, more people will be on the move. This isn't just a question of what abstract institutions do. It's something that we can all engage with. So what could you do? I think there are three things I'd highlight. Innovation, engagement, and building bridges. Innovation. This is an area that needs updating. Refugees are human beings. They represent cross-sections of their societies. Everything from technological change, blockchain, the internet offers huge opportunities for innovation and entrepreneurship, including social entrepreneurship, that can support opportunities there or here. Engagement. Find out what's going on in your local community. Find out about who's being resettled to where you live. 
What's the political response? What's the social response? Who are the refugees in your neighborhood? Why are they there and how can they be supported? And finally, build bridges. Reach out to people as human beings. Have conversations about refugees. 0.3% of the world's population should be manageable. It's been opportunistically exploited by politicians. It has to stop and we have to help people to help themselves, support their communities and the societies they've come from. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Nick. Um, so a lot of the global discourse has uh, revolved around the Syrian refugee crisis. Um, but Venezuela in particular has gone un un unfocused uh, for a while until recently. So considering the rate at which um, these Venezuelans are emigrating uh, at a uh, fairly rapid pace, um, to what extent would you argue that, because a lot of the countries around Venezuela in particular, and, uh, Colombia, Panama, and Brazil, uh, have a hard time managing the, the amount of um, refugees that come to these countries. So to what extent would you argue that um, there needs to be a point where we, those countries simply can't take enough and we, there needs to be done, something done about the Venezuelan, uh, at this point, dictatorship? I, I think what's going on in Venezuela is deeply tragic and it illustrates a couple of big challenges. One is that there's a certain amount of compassion fatigue around refugee movements that Syria, as you said, took a lot of the focus and it distracted us from many uh, refugee movements around the world. Others like Yemen, South Sudan, to some extent even what's been going on with the Rohingya in Rakhine State have fallen below the radar. But I think there's another reason which means Venezuela is treated a little bit differently. And it's because it's an example where the line is blurred between who's a refugee and who's an economic migrant. And often we work with those distinctions as though they're very clear distinctions. Either you're fleeing political persecution or you're, fleeing, or you're moving because you want a better life. But actually there's a very blurred gray area. And of course, governments have to draw lines somewhere. But the reality is there are lots of movements which I would call survival migration, where people have to move to access their basic rights. They have no opportunity other than to cross a border in order to avail themselves of those basic rights, basic subsistence, basic security, basic liberty, the rights without which it's impossible to enjoy, enjoy any other rights. Um, and situations like um, Zimbabwe, to some extent, Myanmar pre-persecution in Rakhine State, some of the movements from the, the Karen and the areas, a lot of those were mixed up with economic deprivations. Um, we're going to have to grapple more and more with the people in those gray areas that flee fragile states, that flee socioeconomic deprivations, food insecurity, water insecurity, climate change, and work out which of those people we believe has a human rights-based entitlement to cross a border. And I think at the moment it's very easy to, to ignore Venezuela because it doesn't neatly fit the refugee mold, and also because it's a relatively wealthy middle-income country, there's an assumption that it will, in time, revert back to the status quo ante and people will be able to move back from the neighboring countries. Hello, my name is Jack. Thank you very much for uh, your lecture. Um, in terms of uh, allowing uh, refugees the right to work, is the solution of simply opening up uh, the ability to work in the economy of the host nations, or is, it, uh, does, is there a need for a more active role by the government uh, in the way that uh, we see Germany allowing uh, more social uh, benefit programs for migrants, uh, uh, such as uh, you know, street cleaning, you know, general infrastructure improvement. Is that a better solution? Is that an alternative solution? Or is uh, simply allowing uh, refugees the right to work uh, a better solution? Refugees need to be economically included everywhere in the world. I mean, it's, it, it's the most blindingly obvious thing that people don't have to be a burden and one of the best ways in which they can contribute is full socioeconomic participation. And that applies in low and middle income countries as much as it, it does in rich countries. Um, the situation in Germany is a little bit unique because it comes from having a very, regu firstly having a very regulated labour market, uh, which makes uh, it very difficult to access jobs unless you have the right paperwork, the right certification. The other challenge with Germany is it, it's a high quality export economy, 
and the gap in terms of GDP per capita between Syria and Germany is enormous. You're going from a $2,000 <coughs> GDP per capita economy to a $40,000 GDP per capita economy. And bridging that productivity gap takes major investment in training and education to support that increase in productivity. So it's much harder, in a sense, from purely economic sense, for somebody to move from an economy like Syria's economy to Germany and thrive competitively in the market than it would be in one of the neighboring countries. So it means we need slightly different solutions to support that economic integration. Germany is embracing that generational challenge of training and education and in some ways providing those quotas um, in public employment. In a much more liberal um, labor market like the United States, you would want to have quite different solutions and something that was lighter touch would probably be more relevant. Um, but across the board, it's not just about what government does to liberalize employment markets. It's also about what business can do, um, not just large business, but small and medium-sized enterprises, not just purely for-profit business, but also social enterprise. Um, there's a lot that can be done to, to support <laughs> jobs, employment, economic inclusion, but it's going to vary a bit from context to context. Will you please, for the presentation of a the award for Dr. Betts. Well, Dr. Betts, thank you for uh, your time and uh, your very compelling um, speech. It's, it's disheartening uh, to see those sort of numbers, but it's also uh, the solutions that you're talking about uh, offer a lot of hope. I, I hope we can uh, move it forward uh, in something that's uh, as tragic as it is right now. So thank you for, for, for your very engaging talk. Oh, wow. He's a token gift for wow. you and very wow. appropriate and with your name on it awesome. and everything. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming all the way from Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you again for coming all the way from Utah.